Greetings ladies and gentlemen. In this video we will be talking about another test to talk to determine if a given series converges or diverges. Now this test is called the integral test and before using this test with a given series always keep in mind that your first test that you should ever use to save yourself a lot of time is the nth term test for divergence. If you're not familiar with what that test is then please refer to our video about the nth term test for divergence. Uh, we have a couple of examples there in an explanation. Now, the integral test, in order for us to use the integral test to determine if a, series, if a given series converges or diverges, our series has to meet four conditions, okay? Number one, our series has to be positive on a given interval. For example, let's, let's take the series uh, sigma n equals one goes to infinity of one over n. Now, have we seen this series any, anywhere? Well, yes we have. This is a special case of the P-series called the harmonic series. Now, we know from the definition of the harmonic series, the harmonic series is always divergent. Uh, we also know that to prove this, we can also use the P-series test because P is, greater, P is equal to one, in this case, and it's divergent. Uh, we have a video about that as well that you're more than welcome to see. So, let's, let's, let's use these four conditions on this series, okay? So number one, is this series positive on the given interval? Keep in mind that the interval here is uh, one to infinity, including one, okay? So, for any number that, you, that we substitute in for n, one, two, three, four, we're always going to end up with a positive result, okay? Uh, if you're ever unsure about that, simply plug in numbers on the interval and uh, see what happens. Or plug in numbers from the interval into the series. The next thing that we should do, okay, so, so condition number one is met in this case. Condition number two says equal. Now what does equal mean? Um, a lot of the books don't say it like this, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, the reason why I add this additional step is because we can say that our series, this is a sub n, we can rewrite this series 1 over n as 1 over x. In other words, set the series equal to a function equal to f of x, okay? Because a lot of times we are familiar, when we take the integral, we are familiar with taking it with respect to x, and that's perfectly fine, and that's exactly how we're going to proceed with this. So condition number two is met in this case. Now, condition number three is that the series has to be decreasing, okay? Now, if the series is decreasing, that means that if we plug in our first number, okay, uh, we sh the, the first term should be larger than the next term. Okay, now what does that mean? That means that for any, let's say we have one over x already because we've set it equal to, so if we plug in one on in here, so we get f of one is equal to one over one, which is one. Now let's plug in two over here, because two is the next term, right? The reason why we plug in two is we want to see if the first term is larger than the next term, because if it is larger, then obviously what's happening is that the series will keep on decreasing. Your numbers will keep on decreasing as, uh, as, as, as you plug in more terms. So one over two, this is one half. Now a half, a half is 0.5, one is one. A half is smaller than one. Therefore, we can say that the series is decreasing. Now the other way that I wanna talk about this, and I have given this, and I have explained this terminology in the introduction to, uh, to series uh, video, but what I want to do is I want to plug in an n plus one term, okay? Uh, given that n is equal to 1. So I want to say 1 over x is our first term. 1 over x plus 1 is our next term. Okay. Okay. Uh, essentially what, what I did here is I said that if x is equal to 1, then x plus 1 would obviously be equal to 2. And I'm just doing this in the general case without really, uh, without really substituting numbers. All right? Now the idea is that if you, this is a larger fraction than this, okay, which means that 
excuse me, which this is a larger denominator than this, which means that if we have in any fraction, if we have a larger denominator, then that fraction turns out to be smaller. Let's think about this. If we have a half and a third, all right? This denominator is larger than this one. Okay, let's think about this in decimals. This one is 0 0.5, this one is 0 0.33 continuous. 0 0.5 is larger than 0.3. In other words, the one with the larger denominator ends up being the smaller fraction. So, this one has a larger denominator than this, therefore it is smaller. Therefore the first term is larger. Okay. So, we just found that uh, we are decreasing because of this. Okay. Our next term is smaller than our first term. Okay. So that's one way of doing that. The other way of seeing if a function is decreasing or not is simply by taking its derivative. Okay. Now, if f of x is equal to 1 over x, then the first derivative is equal to negative 1 over x squared. If we plug in any number on the interval over here, we get a negative output, a negative y value. Now, what that tells us, and if you have any question about this, this is from calculus, calculus 1. Uh, what that tells us from a negative value of a derivative is that our original function is decreasing. So we have found two ways of finding it if this is decreasing. Okay. We can, uh, let's see, compare uh, general terms, okay? That's our first way. Comparing the general terms means this, or simply plug in numbers, okay? That works as well. Number, the other way that we found out about doing this was finding the first derivative and substituting a number from the interval and we get a negative output. Now, our last, our last condition is to find out if this function is continuous. Right, so how do, we, how do we check for continuity? Well, to check for continuity, we can see if we have any jumps in the graph, if we have any holes in the graph, if we have any asymptotes in the graph, okay? So to check for asymptotes, we take our function, f of x equals to 1 over x, and let's keep in mind this is a rational function, and uh, take this x, this denominator, set it equal to 0, and solve for x. Well, in this case, x has already been solved for. Essentially, the place where x equals, where the answer for x would make the denominator equal to zero. That would produce a vertical asymptote. Now in other words, we proved that we have a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Therefore, our function is not continuous at x equals zero. But let's keep in mind that our interval starts from one. Okay, therefore, we don't even need to worry about what happens at zero. We're only looking at from one to infinity. All right. Now, all four conditions of this, uh, of this, of the integral test has been met. Now, over here it says that if all the conditions are met, then we can integrate our function, f of x. And then the behavior of that integral tells us the behavior of the series. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if the integral converges or has an answer that is not, has a finite answer, then our series also converges. If the integral diverges, in other words, if it has negative or positive infinity as its answer, then our series will also diverge. And that's what this says. Okay? Now, let's try to integrate this. Uh, n equals 1. So in other words, we can take the limit. Well, let's try to set up this integral. This integral would end up being 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx. Why do I not use n? Well, because in this second step, I had set the series equal to the function. So now I have x's, OK? So the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx. Now, this is an improper integral. Therefore, we will evaluate this with limits, all right? Uh, if you have any question about why we're doing that, well, that's a question more about limits. So send us a message, and we'll uh, get into that. Now, we can rewrite this as limit as b approaches infinity of 1 to b 
of 1 over x dx, the integral of 1 over x is simply equal to the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Now this is a formula that you simply have to memorize. So this is equal to limit b approach infinity, well not plus c in this case because this is a definite integral, of natural log absolute value of x evaluated from 1 to b. Now, do we really need the absolute values in this case? The answer is no, because on 1 to infinity, we can never have a negative result. So let's take off the absolute values. Right here. Okay. What I mean by a negative result is when you substitute 1 in for x in the natural log of x, or any number past 1, we'll always end up with a positive result. Now this will give us, let's substitute these limits of integration in. We'll get the limit as b approaches infinity of the natural log of b, and this is simply the fundamental theorem of calculus, minus the natural log of 1. Now by definition, ln of 1 is equal to 0. So this is then equal to limit b approaches infinity, and I'll write this right here, this is equal to 0. Uh, and be approaching infinity of the natural log of b. All right. Now, how do we evaluate limits? Well, we simply substitute in what b equals or what b approaches. So this would end up being the natural log of, substitute the infinity in for b, the natural log of infinity. Now let's think about this. Infinity is a really, really, really large number. If we put in a really, really large number into a natural log function, will end up getting an incredibly large result. Okay, keep in mind that the natural log function is always increasing. Okay, it always looks like, if we just remember the function of the natural log, it looks something like that. All right, and this is not drawn to scale, of course. So, this we can say is infinity. Infinity is the answer to this integral. Therefore, this integral is a divergent integral. So now, what does our explanation say about a divergent integral? It says, if the integral diverges, then our series also diverges. Okay. Now, let's think back to the harmonic series. The harmonic series is, also, is always a divergent series. right? So we proved that two ways, once by the p-series and once by the integral test. All right? So it shows us that we can use multiple tests for the same problem. It's just that some tests might be easier than others. All right, let's look at one more example of this, of the integral test. Let me just erase these check marks right here. Okay, if we have sigma n equals 1 to infinity, well, let's, let's say n equals 0 to infinity, because we last time used 1. n plus 1 over n cubed. All right? So how will we evaluate this with the integral test? Okay. Well, our first method to start any series is a term test for divergence. And just by looking at this, I can say that the n term test for divergence fails in this case, it is inconclusive, so we have to use something else. Uh, how do I know that? Just by looking at it? Well, take a look at our uh, video for the nth term test and you'll figure it out, all right? Now, let's look at our four conditions. On the interval from zero, zero to infinity, is this function positive? In other words, for any number that I put in between zero and infinity, in, and infinity will I get out a positive result? And the answer is yes, okay? Now, can we set it equal? Yeah, of course. We can say that this is equal to f of x is equal to x plus 1 over x cubed, okay? So, this is fulfilled, this is fulfilled. Now, is this function decreasing? Okay. Oh, I'd also like to point out, we're positive. Is this function positive at x equals 0? Well, no. Because when you substitute in zero, you would get zero in the denominator. In other words, it's asymptotic at zero. There's, an, there's a vertical asymptote there. So what do we do? Well, 
Zero to infinity is a large group of numbers. It's extremely, extremely large. Now, if I just push the zero aside and just go to go from one to infinity, it's there's no problem. So in other words, I do have to specify that. So I have to say that I am positive 